Hello, and welcome to today's webinar, Substance Use Cost Calculator for Employers. I'm Tracy McPherson, and I'll be your moderator for today's event. This webinar is produced in partnership with the National Safety Council and NORC at the University of Chicago. You can access everything for this webinar at the website on your screen, both now and in the future. The URL is nsc.org slash workplace drug use. I recommend that you bookmark this page for future use. Our team will also send you a follow-up email that includes links to the on-demand recording and a brief survey. We have an exciting presentation planned for you today. We'll have some opening remarks. You'll also uh, be receiving a demonstration of the substance use cost calculator, and we'll have a discussion about the analysis of the results and the data and the steps that employers can take to address substance use. You can access the PowerPoint slides through the handouts pane of your GoToWebinar control panel on your computer or on your mobile device, or you can download them from the website. You can ask questions at any point through the questions pane of your GoToWebinar control panel on your computer or your mobile device. Answers will be posted on the website. Now it's my pleasure to introduce our speakers. Dr. Eric Goplerud is a clinical psychologist and the founder and chairman of the board of the Faith Alliance for Climate Solutions. Until his retirement in 2018, he served as vice president and a senior fellow in the Public Health Department at NORC at the University of Chicago. Previously, he was a research professor in the Department of Health Policy at George Washington Medical Center and Associate Administrator for Policy and Planning at SAMHSA. Professionally, he is a nationally recognized behavioral health policy expert and researcher. Also presenting today is Rachel Cooper, who is the Senior Program Manager of the Impairment Practice Area at National Safety Council. Rachel has worked in the substance use field both in the U.S. and abroad, focusing on overdose prevention, harm reduction, and policy. At the National Safety Council, she oversees all initiatives related to impairment, opioid use and misuse, and mental health. Currently, most of her work is focused on employers, employees, and getting employees the support they need. And we'd like to thank Nationwide for funding the Substance Use Cost Calculator. We're honored to have with us Kristen Ross, a senior consultant at the Nationwide Foundation, who will speak a few minutes about this important tool. In her current role, Kristen is responsible for the implementation of Nationwide's philanthropic strategy. She also serves as project director for the Ohio Opioid Education Alliance, which is a coalition of over 95 business, government, and nonprofit entities from across Ohio that have come together to help end the opioid crisis. Thanks for joining us, Kristen. I'll turn it over to you. Thank you, Tracy. I really appreciate it. I'm excited to be here today. And we at Nationwide, we're, we're happy to fund the Substance Use Cost Calculator. We have used it at Nationwide, and it's really helped guide our work that we have done with our associates and with our second chance policies. And we've also used it um, in the work with the Ohio Opioid Education Alliance. Like Tracy mentioned, it's a partnership with over 95 corporate and government entities. And as we've gotten our, asked our corporate partners to come along uh, with us to help prevent opioid use, um, we, oftentimes we hear, we don't have a problem. There's not a problem here. And what we found the most effective to get um, corporations to understand that there is a problem and that, that we all need to work together to, to solve that problem is the substance use cost calculator. So we'd sit down with them, walk them through the tool, have them put in their data, and you know we'd get some raised eyebrows, uh, and then they'd go back to and run their own data and 
always came back to us and said, you're right, uh, this is very accurate and we do have a problem and we do wanna join the Ohio Opioid Education Alliance to help, um, to help prevent future generations and help you know, solve the, pro the current problem that's going on. So um, we couldn't be more pleased or excited um, to help fund this project. And you know, like I said, we use it um, almost every day as we talk with partners across the state of Ohio. Um, and so now it's my pleasure to turn, um, turn it over to Rachel Cooper, who's going to talk us through the rest of our presentation. Thank you. Well, a huge thank you to you, Kristen, and to the entire Nationwide team for funding this important work. We really couldn't do it without you, and you are a wonderful example for all of the employers in our communities to really start to address substance use in their workplace. So thank you to all of you for tuning in to today's webinar on the Substance Use Cost Calculator. I'm just here for a moment before turning it over to Eric to talk a little bit about the National Safety Council's work in this space. The National Safety Council has been engaged in this work for nearly a decade, recognizing early on that the opioid crisis was having tangible impacts on workplaces, including impacting the financial state of the workplace, impacting safety, and hurting the greatest strength a company has, their employees. We have devoted ourselves to helping workplaces address substance use with tools such as our Opioids at Work Employer Toolkit, materials on cannabis and other impairing substances, and of course, this interactive tool that we are discussing today, the Substance Use Cost Calculator. It is designed to help you quantify the impact substance use has on your workplace and also to link you to further tools to help you address substance use in the workplace and protect the health and safety of your workplace and your employees. I am pleased now to turn it over to Eric, who will start by walking us through how to use the substance use cost calculator before doing a deep dive into the data. Eric, over to you. Thank you, Rachel. Hello. Uh, just to uh, uh, re-emphasize, this is a tool which takes information from very large government surveys, uh, uh, approximately 250,000 people who were interviewed over the course of, a th of three years, 2015 through 2018, uh, about their substance use. Uh, almost two thirds of them are employed. So there's a very large database here to uh, examine questions about substance use and its impact in the workforce. The reason that we use such a large database is that we want to be able to help you, an employer, get a sense as to what is the, the substance use problem, at least from an epidemiological basis, that is in your workforce, how it's costing you, and more important, what the benefits are of, re, of helping your employees and their family members uh, uh, get in recovery and uh, uh, get effective treatment for their addiction. So if you were to go into the website here, the nsc.org backslash drugs at work, this is, the, this is what would come up. This is the, the only data that you would have to put in to get an effective epidemiologically based assessment of what the likely prevalence of substance use is among your workforce and their family members and also how it's costing you and what you can do to help your employees achieve recovery. So here are the data, the only data that would be put in, and what's important also to emphasize here is that this data is only your data. It, there is no tracking that uh, takes place. This is entirely uh, um, uh, anonymous. So here are the data points, and we, we entered some, some information here uh, with the arrows. Uh, if you can see, we selected Nevada as a, as a state. Uh, there are uh, every one of the states and nationwide uh, uh, data are, are, are already entered into the calculator. You also put in the number of employees in your organization. Now, many of the larger corporations will likely have more than one state in which they are operating. So you can also click on the add additional state and add the what state or what states 
uh, you may also have plants or offices in and the number of employees in that. You can do multiple states and uh, uh, receive uh, uh, the data from that. Also, we have information uh, which you would then select of one of 17 industry sectors. Uh, these are very familiar sectors which uh, are the ones used by the Department of Labor. Uh, we happen to select here construction. Now, the, the last thing that you would do is to put in your email address here, and you would receive through the email address uh, a, 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 a report specific to the data or the company that you have put in. And then you simply hit the button here that says, get your report. And this is what would immediately come up. And this is these are data for a company, as I, as I mentioned, in Nevada with 500 employees in the construction sector. Okay. For uh, uh, other industries, for other size of uh, uh, employee uh, base, uh, and for uh, a different sector or, or state, the, uh, these data would change. And we have it in, in, in uh, overall what the cost is of untreated substance use in this um, example is nearly a million dollars. And that comes in three specific buckets, lost time, turnover and retraining, and healthcare. Now, what goes into each one of these, you can find by clicking on the button here shown by the arrow, which says expand cost detail. But what goes into each one of these is the, under lost time, is the number of, uh, greater number of days taken off with unscheduled leave or illness, injury, or other reasons, not vacation, uh, that, people with untreated substance use have compared to their peers in the same industry and state uh, who do not have a substance use disorder. Uh, all of the costs are estimated based on Department of Labor uh, information updated to July 2020, uh, so that what we have here is the estimated cost in that industry of excess time taken off. Job turnover similarly is figured based on the greater number of employees who have a substance use problem who will have more than one employer in the prior year. The cost of turnover is averages about 21% of annual salary cost. So the higher the unanticipated, the higher the excess rate of, um, of uh, uh, turnover increases the cost of employers of uh, hiring and replacing and retaining uh, the workforce. These costs are also uh, based on Department of, uh, Bureau of Labor Statistics, Department of Labor data about uh, average salaries, fully loaded. Healthcare costs, are based on the paid claims costs for hospitals, emergency departments, primary care, medications, mental health, and substance use services. Paid claims by commercial insurance, so insurers that are covering uh, uh, employed populations. Now, uh, this, these costs are based on the excess health care use by people with untreated substance use disorders compared to, to their peers who do not have, in the same industry and state, who do not have a substance use disorder. Uh, the the uh, costs are not the total cost of care. Employers on average in the United States pay about 75 to 77% of healthcare premiums employees pay the other 25% or so. Those employers that also offer a family benefit generally cover in the range of about 75% of healthcare costs. So the healthcare costs that are shown here are the healthcare costs that would be borne by a self-insured employer 
or an employer who's paying for a fully insured plan. Now to get more detail and to see how, how did we get to these numbers? Oh, if you click on the button here that says expand cost details, this is what information will come up. Uh, under excess days missed annually, these are the number of actual uh, estimated days in this company in Nevada of workers who take uh, um, unanticipated leave for illness, injury, or other reasons, not vacation, compared to their peers. Similarly, in this workforce, we would anticipate that there are an average of 24 additional folks or an excess number of folks who will leave the workforce and require replacement and retraining. Under excess healthcare costs, we're showing the expected excess number of days, hospital days, emergency department visits, and outpatient ambulatory primary care visits. Uh, and each of these are, 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 you know, have, have costs that impact employers. And then finally, under excess roadway risks, people with untreated substance use disorders are far more likely to report driving under the influence of alcohol or drugs uh, on or mostly off duty than uh, their peers. Also, they are somewhat more likely to report never or seldom wearing a seatbelt. These clearly have implications for injury, for illness, and for uh, uh, unanticipated turnover. Now, to, to drill down, we can get a reasonable estimate of actually how many employees and how many of their family members are likely to have a serious substance use disorder. In this case, 93 out of 500 employees in construction in Nevada are likely to have an untreated substance use disorder in your workforce. You may not know that they are there, but based on the evidence from uh, large surveys finding over and over again, this is about the number that you would expect are there and could be could receive effective treatment and recover. Also, families come, or employees come with families. And this is about 68 family members are likely to also have a substance use disorder. Their costs or health care are likely to be uh, added into the costs for um, uh, employers. Because we're using such large databases, we can provide you also with estimates that drill down even further. What are the specific substances that are likely to be the biggest problems in your workforce and among their dependents? And if you take a look here, overwhelmingly, and we see this, we've seen this for 20 years as we've done these, this kind of research, alcohol is overwhelmingly the largest uh, uh, substance of abuse and dependence. Opioids and heroin uh, are substantially smaller, but the concern that employers have and uh, uh, nationwide we have with opioids and heroin is that to a large extent, the problem with opioids is a, an, an issue caused by, or at least complicated by, the medical system, which has overprescribed in the past opioids, and uh, because of the uh, danger now of fentanyl uh, that's come into uh, the country and that has such a high lethality that uh, many people who um, are addicted to opioids are at much greater risk of death. Uh, because of the added uh, fentanyls. Cannabis is uh, probably the second largest or the, has the second uh, greatest percentage of employees and family members who have a full substance use disorder. So this, this gives you a breakdown. Now, something extremely important to emphasize is that when employees who have had a past substance use disorder 
receive effective treatment and recover. And we define recovery as a person who, re a, a worker who reports having had a, a substance use treatment in the past, but who have not met criteria in the past 12 months of a substance use disorder. So a worker who is in recovery avoids, their employer avoids more than $4,000 in turnover and replacement costs on average. They take almost two weeks, I guess, no, it's work weeks, uh, two and a half weeks less unscheduled leave per year than employees with a substance use disorder. And overall, they save, compared to a, a, a person with an untreated substance use disorder, they save their company an average of $8,500 per year, every year. And if you click on the button, you can learn why. Now, also on this, this page of results, you will get and you will see what is the, what are the benefits? What are just the cost benefits of taking action and helping your employees and their family members to receive effective treatment and recover? There's a slider here on the page and it's set uh, when it comes up at, a, at about 50% of those, uh, your employees, if you were to help them get treatment and, and recover, what would the savings be? And in this company, if you recall uh, early on, the overall cost of untreated substance use was nearly a million dollars. If half of your employees in that company were to receive treatment and, and uh, recover, almost $450,000 in savings every year would accrue to the company. And we can get into what the um, what the, those specifics are. Now, I'm going to take a couple of deep dives here into areas which we call issue briefs. And in each one of these areas, we have done and provided on the website a, a brief that goes into a lot more detail than I'll be able to go into in this webinar. But also the end that will provide you with uh, uh, more information about why this is an issue, how this impacts your workforce, and most important, what you can do about it to address the issues uh, associated with these problems. So first, these are the key takeaways across all of the data that are available in the calculator. First of all, the average cost for each employee who has an untreated substance use disorder uh, has grown by about 30% between now and three years ago when the, the previous version of the calculator was done. It's costing you 30% more than it did three years ago in excess healthcare costs. Employers spend nearly $9,000 on average on each employee who has an untreated substance use disorder. Now, this varies substantially by industry, uh, depending on salaries. It also depended on the prevalence of the substance use in their workforce. And finally, each employee who recovers from a substance use disorder saves a company about $8,500. This is probably the, these are the three key takeaways. Now, if we do a deep dive, as we've done in the issue briefs, We've looked at occupation and the de uh, Department of Labor um, identifies hundreds of occupations, but groups them into about 15 occupational categories. We've analyzed the epidemiological data to look at the prevalence by occupation. And what we find is that uh, Construction in particular, about one in five construction workers has a substance use disorder. Here we're showing both the high and the low end of uh, prevalence of substance use disorders by occupation. 
the construction trades and extraction workers, mining, uh, it's nearly 20%. Service occupations, uh, also very high, 15.6%. Sales is about the middle, farming. And then down at the lower end, uh, education, health, related occupations, and protective services are, are less than average. This is a, a pattern that we have seen for decades, that in those industries, or I'm sorry, in those occupations, which uh, have a, a high percentage of males, and particularly young males, tend to have very high percentages of substance use disorders across most drugs, but particularly alcohol and marijuana seems to be showing up again. Those industry, those occupations, uh, education, health, protective services, uh, which tend to have uh, more uh, uh, gender mixed workforces and older workforces tend to have fewer uh, a, a lower proportion of substance use. But even in education or in government services, nearly one out of 15 employees has a sub, is likely to have a substance use disorder. Now, as I was saying, substance use in gender shows very different, and we have a, a, a brief that is specific to this. Substance use is much more prevalent among men than women, and men are more likely than women to uh, receive treatment for a substance use. However, and this is for working men uh, and working women, working women are more likely than men to use smaller amounts of alcohol or drugs for a shorter period of time before they develop a dependency they also are more likely to report co-occurring psychological and physiological uh, um, uh, concerns. The treatment for both men and women who work uh, is equally effective. Both treatment, substance use treatment for men and women is equally effective, but men are much more likely to be referred to and to receive substance use treatment there are uh, generally insufficient culturally sensitive uh, treatment programs for women. Now, this is, a, this is looking at our healthcare data in a little different way, an issue brief on how, do, uh, how does substance use impact employer healthcare costs? We go through in quite a bit of detail in this brief about how we went about estimating the difference in employer's costs for uh, employee substance use uh, disorders. What we want to emphasize here is that when a, an employee is in recovery, they use substantially less health care services than an employee who has an untreated substance use disorder. Now, looking at the age distribution of people with a substance use disorder, uh, we've, what we find is that uh, uh, the employee, employees who are in recovery are a bit older than others. So it may be that uh, there would be even greater healthcare savings to employers were uh, we to match employees on age, but this gives you a general idea. Turnover is, is similarly uh, has an impact and has a savings for employers. Well, if a worker with a substance use disorder in our issue brief is 40% more likely to report having more than one employee than their peers, and also are about 40 to 50% more likely to report turnover than a worker who is in recovery. Short-term disability, long-term disability, return to work. We find that substance use, and there's a, a, a detailed um, issue brief on this, 
we find that substance use increases the risk of and exacerbates other illnesses, particularly alcohol. Alcohol is associated with about 58 diagnoses of illnesses and injury. Also, alcohol in particular increases the risks of injury both on and off the job. Substance use extends the length of disabilities and complicates return to work. And here in particular, the prescribing of prescription opioids uh, has a major impact on the ability of people to return from uh, disability, and particularly musculoskeletal injuries uh, and uh, um, other uh, 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 surgery. Prescription opioids are a critical concern of employers. And what our issue brief goes into in substantial detail is that prescription opioid medications can be and are being misused by anyone, regardless of age, gender, occupation, or industry sector. But in those occupations where workers are at greater risk of physical strains or injuries, they're more likely to misuse prescription opioids and become addicted. Cannabis are, is a, an issue where we now have uh, 35 states that have legalized medical marijuana, and I believe 16 states now have legalized recreational cannabis. About 1.5% of all working adults meet the diagnostic criteria of a cannabis use disorder. What's probably most important to emphasize here is that cannabis still is a Schedule I drug and is illegal federally. It is and remains an issue for uh, uh, employees in industries that have uh, uh, sens workplace sensitive or uh, Department of Transportation regulated uh, uh, positions. And finally, driving under the influence. About uh, nearly 15% of workers report driving under the influence at least once in the previous year. This jumps to almost 60% of workers who have an untreated substance use disorder. 10% of workers, uh, about 10 to 15% of workers who are in recovery report that much, uh, driving under the influence. Off the job, substance use, uh, driving under the influence costs employers through lost time and medical expenses. And what research clearly shows is the commercial motor vehicle operators have very, very low rates of DUI, very low rates of substance use, alcohol use, one area that it seems to be a particular concern is stimulants, cocaine and amphetamines. So we go into that in the uh, driving brief. Now, we also have one more brief that will be coming online on alcohol, and that will be delivered sometime in the near future. Thank you. Now I'll hand it back off to uh, Rachel Cooper. Thank you so much, Eric, not only for all of your work, but for doing such a detailed deep dive into the data. So I am now um, going to talk a little bit more about some of the actions that employers can take and also a little bit more about some of the what else we found about prevention, screening tools, treatment, et cetera. So we do also have an entire issue brief that really focuses on this particular topic here, prevention, screening tools, and workplace policies. We know in broad strokes, of course, that strong workplace policies surrounding substance use can help reduce unplanned absenteeism, reduce excess health care costs, and help address productivity losses. A couple components that NSC traditionally really likes to focus on when we talk about prevention in the workplace, um, not only, of course, about policies, but about how these policies should be created. Um, obviously, policies should be clear. They should be clear about substance use and they should be communicated to your employees. Policies don't work if employees don't understand what's in them. Drug, workplace drug policy should absolutely be clear about the use, possession, or sale of drugs on company premises and control the consumption of drugs or alcohol during work hours. So, for example, you know, um, 
no alcohol if you're going out to a company lunch, for example, is a really common policy. Um, stuff like that is really important to make very, very clear so that employees don't have any questions about what is allowed and what is not allowed. We also talk about the role that supervisors can play in preventing substance use and substance use disorders in the workplace. Supervisors are often an employee's door to the rest of the workplace. They are the person that we talk to the most, that we interact with the most, and oftentimes as an employee, they might be the person who knows the employee the best. So they would be possibly the first person to really notice a difference in an employee's performance, in their personality and activities, and they may be the first to be able to notice some sort of impairment on the job. We also will talk more about this later, but um, employee assistance programs are critical in terms of prevention. They can provide screening tools. They can really take a deep dive into providing resources for people who, who utilize the EAP. And like I mentioned, I'm going to talk more about that later. But um, one of the things that we are just going to keep repeating is that it's exceptionally important to continue to communicate the presence of your employee assistance program to your employees frequently and in a multitude of ways. Oftentimes, there are many things going on, and as an employee, somebody may not think, hey, I don't need to know about the EAP, I'm fine. And then when they do need it, they don't have the necessary information. So making sure that information is accessible, easy to use, et cetera, is always really important. Benefits also play a strong role in prevention, and we talk about this frequently in terms of opioid use. Um, we want benefits plans to cover at the same rate as opioid prescription medications, other pain management techniques, be it physical therapy, occupational therapy, et cetera. And we want to ensure that our prescribers that are on the workplace benefits plans are abiding by all of the CDC prescribing guidelines as well. Lastly, culture, workplace culture is a critical part of prevention. And that might seem obvious, but if you don't have a workplace where you can address issues early on, where employees don't feel safe as they need to speak up and discuss issues, it might be very difficult for them to really take action early on about preventing um, maybe some problematic substance use from turning into a substance use disorder or from noticing that one of their fellow colleagues isn't doing well and not knowing what to do so they just don't say anything at all. Having a workplace culture where employees can feel safe about bringing pro pro uh, problems to the forefront, to talking to supervisors, to talking to HR is a really important part of prevention as well. Next, I'm going to talk a little bit about substance use disorder treatment. So one in every 12 health workers has an untreated substance use disorder. That number jumps. For example, 19% of workers in construction have an untreated substance use disorder. And it, those numbers that Eric talked about previously certainly you know, vary from industry to industry and occupation to occupation. However, you know, we know that the majority of people with a substance use disorder do not get treatment. And they could certainly benefit from treatment. And treatment type varies. It varies from substance to substance. Oftentimes when you're talking about opioids, you're going to be talking about medications for addiction treatment, which are absolutely the gold standard. Common issues with medications for addiction treatment involve um, not being clear about benefits coverage, not being sure about um, <clears throat> you know, do these medications impair, how long should somebody be on them. It can be very confusing for employers, so I highly recommend that you check out the treatment section of the National Safety Council's Opioids at Work Employer Toolkit, where we do a deep dive into the differences between different treatment modalities and, and, and what employers can really expect here. Workplaces can increase the amount of people with substance use disorders who get treatment by ensuring full coverage. It sounds like something obvious to say, but it is more complicated than that. So not only does this include the medications that I just mentioned, but also the full slate of behavioral health coverage and um, varying treatments there as well. Treatment differs from person to person. What works for one person might not work for another. Again, it also varies from substance to substance. You saw Eric walk through previously that we talk about alcohol, we talk about cannabis, we talk about opioids and heroin, we talk about other illicit drugs. The options are not the same across the board. So it's really important that we work with our benefits providers and really match on the employer side with policies around flexible time, around sick time, et cetera. That means that you know employees can attend the necessary appointments, that they can really prioritize their treatment and recovery plan and help keep the workplace safe. I wanted to mention also, you know, that treatment works. You know, this substance use disorders are just that. They are a medical condition. They are treatable and treat, you know, treatment is expected to work. Recovery should be the expected outcome of treatment. And I, I just want to, to take a moment to, you know, we've had a lot of complexities. We've talked about a lot of different things here. It may feel right now like there's a lot of information coming in your ears and you're not entirely sure what to do. 
I want to talk a little bit about people in recovery. So we have these statistics here, right? That you know, workers in recovery help avoid employers help avoid help employers avoid over four thousand dollars in turnover and replacement costs. They miss less time. You know, they save companies a significant amount of money. But there's a certain personal aspect here too that I want to mention. Recovery is a personal journey, and it's just as unique as the individual who has the substance use disorder. One person's recovery may differ dramatically from another person's recovery. Relapse is often a natural part of recovery as well, so this is something that you may see in the workplace, and this is certainly something that employers have concerns about due to safety concerns. Recovering from a substance use disorder <clears throat> often includes making significant changes in somebody's life, and these can be difficult to maintain. We've certainly seen this this year with the COVID-19 pandemic that, stressful conditions, things beyond our control are really difficult to cope with. You know, so people with a substance use disorder may actually relapse one or more times before recovery becomes long term. That is not something that is abnormal and it doesn't mean that somebody has failed. It just means that they haven't found the right path forward yet and we can still continue to help them as employers. One component of successful recovery often includes gainful employment. So being employed offers the opportunity to make progress towards personal goals, um, obviously financially as well. It's also, though, it impacts, you know, a restoration of self-confidence and make, being able to make a contribution back to society. This is a really important space for employers to play a role. So we can really help employees in recovery and by embracing them, by, by, by and, you know, doing so really reduces these feelings of stigma and isolation, and it really greatly improves the employee's chances of recovery. It can also help prevent relapse. People in recovery also often have high degrees of, of, of self-awareness and resilience, compassion, dedication, and understanding. This is, these are traits that we prioritize in all workers and certainly should be valued. You know, these are positive impacts that employees can have on the team, on safety, on company, and on culture. So I highly encourage you again to visit the Opioids at Work Employer Toolkit and consider the section on building recovery-friendly workplaces. There are many recommendations that you can implement to reduce stigma and help your employees in recovery feel celebrated and valid. Some specific recommendations that I wanted to discuss real quick is, is talking about, you know, there's three sections here. And the first one is really talking about offering robust health insurance. So 97% of businesses with more than 50 workers offer at least some of their employees individual health insurance options. Within these healthcare plans, though, employers do have actions that they can take to ensure that, you know, they're covering prevention and treatment and making sure that they're doing the most they can to prevent substance use and substance use disorders in these in your employees. So you can ask what your health care plans are doing to actively minimize risks of creating opioid use disorders in the course of treating worker illness and injuries. So, for example, prescribing rates, you can ask about prescribing rates. You know, you can also ask about are your plans abiding by all of the, the parity requirements from the Mental Health Parity and Addiction Equity Act that was passed in 2008. This is certainly something that was passed, but not everybody always abides by it. And it's something that you can ask about and ensure that, you know, your health care plans are providing equal coverage for addiction treatment options and mental health treatment options. Again, back to the prescription opioid component, you can ask to ensure that, um, that demonstrate what your insurer is doing to ensure that their prescribers are abiding by the CDC prescribing guidelines. This is a critical component in, in managing opioid prescriptions and ensuring that opioids that are prescribed are prescribed safely. This is also a question that you can ask your pharmacy benefits manager. We should also make sure that we're asking our health insurer to demonstrate what they're doing, what they do when somebody has a substance use disorder. I mentioned earlier that full coverage of all treatment options is certainly critical. We want to make sure that, you know, that we are asking to see the health insurer's statistics on diagnosing and treating substance use disorders in its covered population. We also want to make sure that those comprehensive treatment options that I mentioned earlier, you know, include coverage for confidential substance use screenings. Oftentimes screening is a critical component into getting people into care. This can really increase the rate of identification of risky substance use, both for alcohol and for other substances. We want to make sure that we cover both in and outpatient treatment. Again, different treatment modalities work for different people. We also want to make sure that these medications are covered, as I mentioned, counseling and other medical services, and then follow-up services as well. Most health insurers are accredited by the National Commission on Quality Assurance, which requires plans to annually report on their rates of initiating and engaging its covered population with a substance use disorder. You can compare your health care plan's rates of substance use initiation engagement with the rates that you find in the NORC and NSC cost calculator that we're talking about here today. If you identify a gap, you can ask your healthcare plan what active steps it will take to identify and treat plan members with a substance use disorder. 
the next recommendation that I want to talk about, sorry, I'm going to go back a couple slides, is really about offering, you know, robust employer policies and programs. And I've touched on this several times already, talking about workplace culture, talking about, you know, flex time and PTO, but there's some specific points that, that I want to cover here. Before I get into it, though, I just want to remind everyone that workers who are in treatment and recovering from substance use disorders are covered by the Americans with Disabilities Act. So when you're developing policies, when you're working with your programs, there's not only that, but um, we want to make sure that you're talking with your relevant legal um, authorities, both federal, state, you know, local, union, et cetera, and making sure that all of your policies are appropriately, um, all of your policies are appropriately authorized by the appropriate people. You know, this is not something where we are not offering legal advice here in this webinar right now, but it's important that you work with the appropriate people to make sure that this is something that it covers all of, all of the things that it needs to, not in terms of, only in terms of caring for your employees, but also legally. So past that, you know, we want to talk about providing disease and disability management services. So, you know, we often have workers who are on either short or long-term disability for a variety of reasons. But we do know that when it's for an injury, often, you know, this can be treated, these injuries can be treated with opioid pain medications. And use of these opioid pain medications can, for more than five days, is associated with increased length of the disability, reduced likelihood of returning to work, and increased risk of developing an opioid use disorder. So in addition to, you know, that's in addition to whatever injury or illness caused the work absence, right? So this is difficult for employers. So employers should really insist that their EAP, benefits providers, et cetera, be watchful for any substance use disorder that returning workers may have acquired during their medical care. So again, not only sometimes people see people develop a substance use disorder outside of the workplace, but it can also be developing as a result of some workplace injury. So this is certainly something that we wanna keep an eye out for. We want to make sure, though, that we're offering both short and long-term disability coverage as employee benefits. So this is, you know, financial and job stability while working through physical or mental injury, distress or illness, substance use disorders, other, you know, external stressors is really, really important. If you contract for these services, you know, make sure that your vendors are providing evidence that they are actively tracking data and requiring prescribers to abide by the CDC prescribing guidelines, as I mentioned earlier, that they're assessing workers for possible substance misuse and intervening to assist when possible. I've mentioned um, employee assistance programs several times now, but I just want to mention it again. Although the majority of workers are covered by these services and they're free and they're confidential and they're focused on solving problems, you know, very few employers, you know, really emphasize their EAP and even fewer employees actually use this, use them. You know, we're looking at possibly, you know, a rate of 4.5% of covered workers utilizing behavioral health services, which is much, much less than the prevalence of substance use and mental health concerns in typical workplaces, which really indicates that most people with substance use disorders and mental health concerns are not utilizing the EAP. One way to address this is to ensure that when the EAP is utilized, that they are actively um, assessing for risky substance use, and then we can really see a rate jump there of, of people who are being identified and linked into care. You know, this is going to be especially important as people return to the workplace uh, as the COVID-19 pandemic continues to evolve. We know already that we have seen a dramatic jump in mental health distress and in substance use, and more than 40 states have reported a rise in opioid overdoses in association with the COVID-19 pandemic. These issues are not going away. So we need to really, you know, marshal all of the tools that we have and ensure that our EAPs are, are a critical component of that to help identify people who need extra support. I mentioned screening tools several times as well. You know, this really increases the rate of identification. Oftentimes people are not going to self-select. And so when we can identify people and say, hey, you know, these are some resources that can really help get people into care earlier. We also want to make sure that we, as an employer, that we can create, um, you know, return to work plans and policies for employees who are dealing with a substance use disorder. Again, this could also be somebody who has taken leave due to a substance use disorder or something occurring in their family as well, but that kind of stress and mental distress can also impact the workplace. So these plans can really provide an outline of expectations and create employer and employee guidelines to help the employee integrate back to work but also keep the workplace safe. And although this can feel complex, careful consideration and collaboration with the employee in question can really create a plan that not only ensures that workplace safety, but supports the employee as they work through their substance use disorder treatment plan and seek recovery. 
Lastly, we can talk about providing worker peer support programs, and this is more common in some industries than others, but these are programs in which workers who have experienced substance use or mental health challenges and learn to manage them are formally trained to support coworkers who are facing similar issues. There are often organizations in your community who work with workforce development or who work on programs like this, and they're a really good resource for starting something like this. And then lastly, I'm just going to talk a little bit about drug-free workplace programs. And this is, you know, something that we talk about frequently at the National Safety Council. It often includes drug testing. These are, these are um, you know, off, we know that 84% of workplaces do offer drug testing. So this is something that, you know, we can keep very simple with drug testing, but the National Safety Council recommends that we really expand these drug-free workplace programs to include prevention, treatment, and recovery. So what this looks like is we want to have, you know, drug testing certainly is a key component for most employers, but we also want to add in these other key components like workplace substance use education. So employee engagement and education leads to a safer workplace. Everyone should be able to recognize, you know, the signs and symptoms of impairment of potential substance use disorders and mental distress, and everyone should be able to understand how to access employer resources and treatment, not only for themselves, Themselves, but for their coworkers as well. This again goes back to having a culture of workplace safety that encourages people to support one another and not to hide potential issues. Um, back to the screening component, you know, offering confidential screening as part of the drug-free workplace workplace programs. This is again benefits, EAP, etc. Critical um, to get people to a medical professional or health professional when needed. We also want to ensure that you know there's a confidential follow-up care to support individuals in recovery. This is going back to the recovery-friendly workplaces comment that I mentioned a few slides ago, as well as some of those worker peer support programs or community connections that you can create to help support workers in recovery. Again, you know, supervisor training can also be part of a drug-free workplace program, and that's something that's really important. We know, like I mentioned earlier, that supervisors play a critical role in addressing, you know, opioids and other substance use in the workplace. But we have to provide them with the tools to protect the safety of the workplace, the privacy of their employees, and teach them how to help. Oftentimes, this can feel very, very complex. So this is something that we want to make sure that our supervisors can do. And then last, we want to make sure, you know, employers, for those of you in heavy labor industries or those with safety sensitive or safety critical positions, we want to make sure that we're re you're revisiting, we're revisiting with you your drug testing policies and scope of testing, you know, frequently. Drugs change. You know, Eric mentioned that, you know, we've been seeing certain trends for decades. And, but this depends on where you are geographically as well. You know, so you, maybe you're a national employer with multiple locations that, you know, experience different trends with different types of drugs. We know that, you know, on the East Coast, it, we got hit on the East Coast more heavily with the initial wave of fentanyl than the West Coast, but it's catching up on the West Coast now. We oftentimes don't, you know, delineate between types of drugs in our drug testing policies. It's like, I'm not going to, you know, work to prevent only one type of drug use in my workplace. That's not the way that this works, but it is important to realize what's happening what's on the ground you know what are your employees doing and drug testing is a one part of that but also something that is more complex and really needs to be addressed by understanding what's happening in your workforce and this tool that we have here the substance use cost calculator is a really critical part of that so again you know we we really encourage you to include clearly defined policies here we second or last chance policies to to move away from zero tolerance to people who do have a substance use disorder do have a chance to get treatment and come back to the workplace really some clearly developed return to work programs and then also clear and defined safety procedures for an employee who is prescribed to opioid painkillers who again may not have a substance use disorder but may be taking a medication who could potentially be impaired so with that, um, I want to thank everyone. I want to thank Kristen and Nationwide one more time, Eric and Tracy, as well for being our star research team and encourage you to reach out to myself or to Eric as needed at the email addresses here on the slide. And then I'm gonna turn it back over to Tracy to do some closing remarks. Well, thank you. Thank you, everyone. Um, what a rich uh, presentation, and it's really exciting um, to hear, uh, get such a thorough review of, of the tool, of the calculator, what goes in it, how does it work, uh, what employers, um, how, they can, how employers can use the information, really, to better understand the impact of substance use on a number of different um, impacts that you were sharing earlier around healthcare costs and turnover and unplanned leave, um, just so many things that you've given us uh, to think about. 
and also for sharing information very specifically, really, about what employers can do, um, specific actions that they can take around their policies, around their programs, around practices, um, uh, including uh, particularly around the use, um, how important it is to encourage the use of employee assistance programs and employers really taking a look, a close look at their healthcare plans. What are the benefits? And are they supporting the use of treatment services? Are they covering treatment services? So um, this has been a terrific uh, webinar today. And so thank you all very much for sharing uh, your expertise. In the last few minutes together, I just want to uh, share a couple of reminders. Our team will send you a follow-up email, and this is going to include a link to the on-demand recording and the brief survey. And we hope that you're going to share this information uh, with your colleagues about the substance use cost calculator and how to access it, as well as the URL nsc.org slash workplace, workplace drug use which is going to be sort of a one-stop shop for how you can access the tool, the issue briefs, and of course the recording. So with that, I wanna thank you so much for attending and I will conclude today's webinar and I hope you have a great rest of your day.